We ready to roll? We're rolling. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here with us. I'm Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of our University Express program, and I work for the Erie County Department of Senior Services. And this is our last class of our spring semester, and we're joined here with Len Lenahan that will be our instructor. Welcome, Len. Nice to be here, Katie. Thank you. We appreciate you. And to everyone who's on, thank you. Quick housekeeping. We are recording the session. I'll try to post it on the website in the near future. Feel free to type in your questions to our Q&A panel and your comments too, because we're hoping for a lot of discussion at the end. If you're on a computer, your Q&A panel is located at the lower right-hand side of your screen. Click on that to expand it, send your questions to me. And a tablet or smartphone, touch your screen. That brings up your control panel. You'll see a circle with three dots, click on that. There you'll find your Q&A. So same thing in that text box, send those questions right to me. Quickly, we'll thank our sponsors, which is my Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for all their support. And Senior Services is at 858-8526 if you ever need anything. All right, the star of our show. Len Lenahan is a former chairman of the Erie County Legislature, where he served for 20 years representing the Tonawandas and parts of the University District in North Buffalo. He also served as chairman of the Erie County Democratic Committee for 10 years, commissioner of elections for Erie County for an interim period of approximately two and a half years, and then from 1996 to 2002, he served as the commissioner of personnel for Erie County. He served as a delegate to the 2004 Democratic National Convention and also also in December of that year was an elector to the 2004 Electoral College from New York State. So he knows quite a bit about this today, folks. I'm going to turn it over. Len, thanks for being here. Thank you, Katie. It's nice, um, nice to be here today. And thank you for everybody who is, is tuning in to uh, join this discussion. And I want it to be a, a pretty open discussion. But I, what I'm going to do is basically I broke down this presentation into three, sort of three sections. One. First part, we're going to talk about how did we get the electoral college? How did we, how did we get here with this system that is still in place um, for electing our president? Um, the second part will be what have been some of the uh, problems? What have been some of the issues um, with the electoral college? And then third, what would be some alternatives if someday we decide to turn um, away from this in, into a different direction? So. I hope uh, you'll enjoy this. The, I'm gonna, the fourth part of it, by the way, is leaving plenty of time for questions, answers, comments. We can debate. We can we can do whatever we want. We've got an hour here, and you know who knows? I might spill over a little bit. But the bottom line is, um, thank you for being here. And let's uh, get started. Katie, would you hit the first um, first graph, please? Okay, just to start off with a very simple um, definition. We'll write the Webster's for this, so we go right by the book. And the Electoral College is the body of people representing the states of the United States who formally cast votes for the election of the president and the vice president. So it's a body of electors chosen um, by a larger group. So that's what it does. But it, so now we're going to go from there and get into the, the nitty gritty, get into the weeds a little bit. Can we have the next slide? So this is a basic Electoral College map. Um, I'm using 2020 it's only because it's up to date with the number of electors each state has. So there's 538 total electoral college votes. And of course, there's 270 needed to win the presidency. Now, there are also, we could have a tie. I mean, um, most of the time our elections are decided um, by the electoral college, but there have been times, and we're going to talk about those, where there have been ties and, and near misses. In other words, Elections that almost ended in a tie. So we're going to talk about that as, as well. So, um, Katie, let's go to the next slide. Okay. So how did we get the Electoral College? How did we wind up with this system that was voted on by the uh, Constitutional Convention way back in 1787? So um, the convention took place in the summer of 1787. And there was um, a number of compromises at that convention, the last one of which was the one that created the Electoral College. But I just want to hit on a couple of the other compromises. Matter of fact, this is a, an important date today. July 16th, 1887 is when they actually hit the great compromise 
out of that convention. So this is an anniversary for the framers of the Constitution, because um, what would be 224 years ago, or was it 234 years ago? Yeah, 234 years ago, um, the um, Constitutional Convention was meeting in Philadelphia, and they came up with the first major compromise of that convention, and that was agreement on where, how we were going to elect a Senate and a House of Representatives. And basically what the framers came up with was, after a very um, hearty debate between large states, small states, um, and it really came down to that they, they wanted one body, one of the legislative bodies, to be represented equally by state. And of course, that's the Senate, where each state gets two votes. That's what it was when they only had 13 states. That's how it is today when we have 50, 50 states. So the first great compromise of that was, okay, we're going to create a Senate that's going to be equally represented by states, not on population, not by the size, the difference between California or Rhode Island. Each state gets two votes. And so then the next major issue that had to be decided was the House of Representatives. How would the House be um, apportioned? And on that, they agreed the population is what made sense, that you had one House, that's the Senate, organized by each state being treated equally, but the lower House would, that would be based on population. So each um, congressional district would have, um, you know, one representative, but of course, according to the size of the state, that would, you know, that would determine the number that each state would have. So the electoral college is basically, the, you know, is um, the number of um, Senate seats, the number of houses in the House of Representatives, and the District of Columbia gets three. That was decided later, but they get three electoral votes. So that accounts for the 538. Um, however, before we go on, and before we get to the electoral college, there's another major issue that we should talk about when it came to apportioning the House of Representatives. In other words, in deciding how many how many uh, people would be elected uh, per state. And that was a major issue that came up when it came to deciding how many representatives does each state get was the issue of slavery. Slavery was a big part of the discussion at the 1787 Constitutional Convention. And basically, there were 700,000 slaves in the South during the um, during during the discussions that took place uh, in 1787, and of course, many people who were not in the South said, "Wait a minute, we're not going to count slaves as part of the population, and that they have no rights, they don't vote." Um, and so, a, a discussion went back and forth about how to settle that. Would they count in the congressional population of the states that had slaves? What they came up with was a compromise. Keep in mind, the Federalists at this convention wanted to get this, this um, Constitution ratified. In order to do that, they needed the support of the Southern states. So they had to make a great bargain. And, and what it came up with, I'm not sure we can call it great, but it, uh, they decided that each slave would count for three-fifths of a, of a white person. This is a very harsh, stark thing to say, but that's exactly what happened. They would give credit to the southern states uh, three fifths of a vote for each slave that they had, and so what that actually did was increase the number of uh, representatives the South had, and it also later on it decided it had an impact on the electoral college. So the first major debate of that constitutional convention was about um, apportioning the Senate and the House. And there are compromises in both cases, but one of the toughest compromises was the, the one dealing with the three fifths compromise, which allowed the southern states to count the slaves as population in their states. So then the next question and that had to be cited, and by the way, the the issue of the electoral college, in other words, how to elect the president, how would that work? That was the last question decided by the convention that year. And but it was a tough debate. It went on for frankly, it went on for a couple of months. They're having a hard time reaching a consensus on what was the best way to 
to elect the president. So what 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 the compromise was and how they came to the Electoral College was based on a, a feeling amongst a lot of the um, framers of that constitution, a lot of the delegates to that convention that the, because at the time, you know, keep in mind 1787, there wasn't a lot of communication. There wasn't a lot, there weren't TV stations, there weren't newspapers. The, the transportation was very minimal. So it was hard for people to get information about what the government was doing and, and frankly, who was running for office. So the framers were saying, we're not sure that the average citizen has enough information. They weren't saying the average citizen isn't bright enough. They were saying they simply don't have exposure to enough information. So they thought a body of people, electors, in other words, the president should be elected indirectly, that the, the, the voters would pick electors and those electors would pick the president. Now, in the minds of the people that um, were at that convention, they were saying that the, the people that should be electors are the, the brightest, the most informed citizens, and frankly, the most neutral. In other words, people did not have a partisan bent one way or the other, but just the best amongst us, um, the most educated, should be the people that really pick the president. And again, keep in mind, this was at a time when the average citizen was first probably working very hard on a farm, didn't have access to a lot of information, um, and had a hard time getting around to listen to candidates. So they agreed on this format of um, each state would get an, this, the number of electors that they had in terms of senators, which is each had two, and then the, based on the number of representatives in Congress that each state had, that would form the electoral college, and then they would, um, they would pick the president. Um, after the election. So there was one more compromise that was reached that we're going to be talking about a little bit later, but it's important for all of us to, to dwell on. When it came time of, in the debate about the Electoral College, when they got down to what happens if there's a tie, and matter of fact, not many years later, there was in fact a tie amongst the Electoral uh, College, what would, how, would that, how would the election be decided? So they decided that in a case of a tie of the Electoral College, the House of Representatives, the House of the People that has equal number of representatives based on the population per state, that they would decide the outcome. However, instead of using, you know, each state getting the number of votes they have per, um, per state, they would only get one vote per state. So, you know, a large state like Pennsylvania, Virginia at the time was the largest state. They would have the, the most votes, but they would get the same number of votes as Delaware, which was the smallest state at the time, Delaware and Rhode Island. Each state would just get one vote. So that is something that we need to talk about a little bit later if that is representative um, as well. But the bottom line is they came out of that convention late in the summer of 1787. It might have spilled even into the fall with the Electoral College being decided that they would, we would have electors. You know, a lot of the framers wanted to have the Congress pick the president, but that would have been a conflict of interest. So the, the whole idea behind the Constitutional Convention was to create a central government that has separation of power. So you couldn't have the Congress, you know, picking the executive branch leader as well. Some framers wanted to have state legislators um, from each state. But then again, the framers saying, well, you're going to have a, a lot of political deals made, the politicians at the local level, that's not a way to pick the president. So the great compromise on the Electoral College was we would have these esteemed, distinguished, well-educated electors, and they would pick the president. So that's how the president, that's how the Electoral College was, was decided. Katie, let's go to the next uh, slide. So at this point, you know, in history, we want to consider, um, has the Electoral College been effective? Um, and basically what happened is the Electoral College worked as intended in the first two elections involving George Washington, because George Washington was elected unanimously both times um, by the electors in the country. And this is before we had political parties. 
So the system did work very smoothly for the first couple of elections. It ran into trouble in the fourth election in 1800. And we'll we'll talk about that in uh, uh, down the road. But what basically what happened in 1800, Thomas Jefferson uh, was running with Aaron Burr. Um, Jefferson had been Secretary of State in the previous administration. He was now running for president. And he had uh, Aaron Burr on the ticket with him as vice president. When the electors got together and voted, they all voted. Oh, but one thing I left out when talking about how the electors would cast their votes, the each elector would get two votes. And the person who came in first would be president. And the person who came in second would be vice president. But what happened in 1800 is the 76 electors enough to um, the, you know, the first vote of each of the electors, 76 electors, one was for Jefferson, the other was for Burr. In other words, it was tied. And Jefferson was the candidate for president, Burr was the candidate for vice president. So the first sign that this electoral college um, proposal and um, foundation would run into trouble is when Aaron Burr, who was running for vice president, got the same number of votes as Jefferson, and he wouldn't drop out. You know, if he was a loyal VP candidate like we have today, that person would have stepped aside, done what it would have taken to elect their person for president. So what wound up happening is in 1800, it went to the House of Representatives as, as the Electoral College wanted and as the Constitution dictated. But they had 35 votes in the Senate, uh, 35 votes in the House of Representatives before um, Jefferson got enough votes to win. And finally, what happened was one of the votes that was for, what happened was the vote was eight to six. Um, after the first vote in the, in the House of Representatives, two votes were, two states were tied. They couldn't agree upon a state. What happened in the end, they couldn't agree upon a candidate. What happened in the end was um, one of the, the, the delegate from Delaware who was supporting Burr, he simply withdrew, taken one vote away from Burr, and then two states, Rhode Island, and I forget, I think the other one was Maryland, they came together, they, they broke their tie, and they wound up voting for uh, Jefferson. So he got the nine votes that he needed to become um, become president. So, will it, so what happened in 1804, before Jefferson ran for the second term, they had to, to fix this flaw in the system. They couldn't have the delegates voting for two people, one for president, one for vice president, because that obviously didn't work. So what they did is they amended the Constitution in 1804, and they basically said each elector will vote for one person for president and one person for vice president. And that's how they resolved the issue of 1800. So, um, again, you know, we'll, we can go back and talk about the 12th. That was the 12th Amendment that was passed in 1804 to the Constitution. The other problem is something we're going to talk about a little more um, broadly, and that is five presidents have been elected without winning the popular vote. So, Katie, let's go to the next, the next frame. No, oh, okay, there we go. So, let's quickly go through the five situations where a president was elected without winning the popular vote. Ironically, in the first two, uh, 1884 with John Quincy Adams, 1876 with Rutherford B. Hayes. Neither of those candidates got the popular vote. It came in first in the popular vote or the electoral vote. Um, but so in 1824, what happened was um, there were four candidates and um, uh, Andrew Jackson came in first by a, a pretty big margin, but he did not have a majority and he didn't have a majority of electoral college because there were four there were four candidates running that year. Um, it was Quincy Adams, um, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, and a gentleman named William Crawford. So the, the Constitution says that the uh, top three candidates will be, will be voted on by the House of Representatives. So what happened was Henry Clay, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives at the time, and he hated Andrew Jackson. So he 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 rounded and he was knocked out of the, the running. So he put the votes together for John Quincy Adams um, to become president, and then he became Secretary of State 
after the uh, election. So, of course, Andrew Jackson was outraged, called it a corrupt bargain, but that's how our electoral college worked in that in that case. The the president didn't come in first in either the popular vote or the um, electoral college, but still became president. Um, and of course, there's always going to be politics in any um, you know any situation where there's an undecided uh, decision and politicians have to come together and decide who's going to win. So. Now we're going to go to 17 or 1876, uh, where Rutherford B. Hayes, he ran against Tilden, uh, Samuel Tilden. Tilden um, came out with the most votes, and and he was one vote short. In other words, he came out first in the popular vote and was one vote short of the Electoral College from becoming president. But there were 20 votes in dispute that year, and the Electoral College and the Constitution did not come up with a manner of resolving, in other words, there wasn't a, a resolution option in the Constitution when you had disputed ballots. So what the Congress did is they appointed a special federal commission to look into the disputes. I think it was in Florida, Louisiana, I forget the third state, but they had to decide, and there was a total of 20 electoral votes. So at the end, this commission awarded all 20 votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. So he won that um, election by one electoral vote. But after the election, he um, had made a deal with the Democrats to withdraw federal troops from the South, which basically ended Reconstruction. In other words, the protection that the federal government had given um, the um, African American uh, African Americans living in the South was withdrawn. And Hayes in order to become president, made a deal with the Democrats and basically withdrew federal troops from the South and ending protections for African Americans in terms of how they live, how they how they can vote. And uh, again, there was a lot of um, yelling and screaming after that as well. But you can see a lot of politics built into the system. So let's go to 1888. Benjamin Harrison um, basically won the electoral college vote after losing to um, Grover. In other words, he he defeated an incumbent president, Grover Cleveland, by uh, Cleveland had received 90,000 more votes than Harrison, but he lost the electoral college. And there wasn't, you know, there's always screams of politics, but there was certainly less rancor that year than there was in 17, than there was in 1876 and 1824 with, with Adams and Rutherford Hayes. So now let's get into modern times. In 2000, George W. Bush won the presidency in 2000 um, while losing the popular vote to Al Gore, Vice President Gore, by over 543,000 votes, almost 544,000. And this, I think most of us can remember, came down to the state of Florida, where Bush um, was ahead by 537 votes when the Supreme Court ended the vote count. They were still counting votes in the year 2000, um, the, the um, Florida Supreme Court had called for a recount and Bush's um, uh, political people, including James Baker, his lawyer, they went to the Supreme Court, said this wasn't fair to have a recount. Bush was ahead by 537 when the state made the decision about the, the recount, state Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ended that. They ruled in favor of Bush in the in the issue of Bush v. Gore, uh, the Supreme Court ended the vote counting in Florida. Bush came out ahead uh, by 537 votes out of 6 million that were cast. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. And then, of course, there's 2016, the year that Trump was elected president um, after Hillary Clinton won by 2.8 million votes, the popular vote. But in three states, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, Trump won by very tiny margins, less than 1% in each of those three states to become, he, so he was able to get enough electoral votes. I think it was 306 um, to 232 in the end. So even though Trump lost the popular vote by almost 3 million votes, he was in fact elected president by slim majorities of winning in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. So um, 
those are the five. And so, Katie, let's go to the next um, graph. So, in order to make my point here, um, I want to talk about the election of 2020. Now, granted, in 2020, Biden won the popular vote and he won the Electoral College. But to talk about the problems with the Electoral College and how it can work, I think 2020 is a pretty good barometer of, of the scale of the problem with the Electoral College. As you can see on your screen, Biden won that vote by over 7 million votes, 81.2 to 74.2. Biden wins by 7,062,500 votes. But Katie, hit the next button. So as you can see on the top, after, um, after the electoral votes were doled out on election night, and it actually, is, if you recall, it took a few days, but Biden had 306, 306 to 232 for Trump. By the way, the same exact numbers Trump in reverse, Trump had 306, the Hillary Clinton's 232 in 2016. So Biden gets 306, but Katie, so I wanna show you something though. Katie, hit the next button. So Wisconsin, up on the top of that yellow circle, the state of Wisconsin, Biden won by a little more than 20,000 votes. So Wisconsin has 10 electoral college votes and Biden won those, even though he won the election by over 7 million, he only won Wisconsin by 20,000. Uh, Katie, hit the next button. The next one we're gonna show you is Arizona. Arizona, again, went to Biden, but it went to Biden by a little over 10,000 votes. And there they had 11 electoral votes. So Wisconsin was 10, um, Arizona was 11. And Arizona was just as close as uh, Wisconsin or even closer. So then Katie's hit the third button, which is Georgia. Georgia, Biden carried Georgia by 12,500 votes. You add up those three states, it came to about 42, 43,000 votes, give or take, you know, a few hundred, whatever. But if you take those three states, Wisconsin with 10, Arizona with 11, that makes 21, and um, Georgia with 16, that's 37 electoral votes. Just for the heck of it, let's take that from the Biden column. Katie, hit the next button. So Biden's down to 269 out of, again, 7 million votes, 44,000 votes difference. Um, hit the button if we give those states to Trump. Look what we have, a tie. So. We would have had, with 43,000 more votes for Trump covering three states, out of, I think we had 165 million people vote. But because the Electoral College counts and the, and the popular vote doesn't, Trump, okay, so we're 269, 269. What did I say about the deal that was cut at the Constitutional Convention in 1787? They allowed the House of Representatives, not based on the number of representatives in the Congress, but each state gets but one vote. In other words, California's vote would be equal to the vote in Rhode Island or Delaware. And guess who would have won the vote in the, in the House of Representatives based on the number of delegations that were controlled by the Republicans? Donald Trump. Trump would have won that election even though he won the popular vote by over 7 million votes. That's how skewed this situation has become. And it's it's a significant, even though Biden won this election, it's amazing what would have happened if three states with a few votes in each of those states um, would have changed hands. It would have been a tie vote, which would have gone to the House, and, and Trump would have been elected. And again, and in the House, you're talking about an unrepresentative situation, even though there were more Democrats in the House than Republicans, because the Republicans have more, they control more delegations, um, regardless of their size and population, Trump would have been elected president. So that's a significant thing to consider. So, so, so Katie, let's now go to the next, uh, next graph.
So how did we get into this situation? How did we get into a situation where by, you know, okay, 2000, uh, Bush loses this, the country by 537 or by 500,000 votes, but still becomes president. In 2016, Hillary Clinton wins by two, almost 3 million votes. She doesn't become president. Biden wins by over 7 million and almost didn't become president. That's because in the Constitution that was voted on in 1787, it says each state shall appoint in such a manner as the legislative thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. So in other words, the states and not the federal government in the end determine um, the electors, how they're chosen and how they're allocated. And that question about how they're allocated is a very important one to consider. And we're gonna take that up now. So let's go to the next, let's go to the next graph. Okay, so how are the electors selected and allocated? As I said before, the states, not the federal government, are given the power to determine how the electors are selected and allocated. Although in the first three or four elections, maybe five or six, there was different ways the states allocated them. Some chosen by the state legislature, some were chosen by district. Um, but by 1824, all states had gone to a winner take all vote in their respective states. The winner take all aspect is very, very significant. And it has huge ramifications on the question, is, is every vote cast in a presidential election considered equal? Now, winner takes all means, okay, just to illustrate winner take all, let's go to the next graph, Katie. Okay, problem with winner takes all. Winner takes all cancels the votes of the people who supported the losing candidate in each state. The best example to talk about is Florida in 2000. As I said before, um, 6 million people, more than 6 million people voted for president in Florida in 2000. Bush won the state by 537 votes, and that's after the Supreme Court cut off the counting, um, which gave Florida, which gave Bush the 29 votes from um, Florida giving him a total of 271 total electoral votes. He won by one vote over the necessary number to win. So 537 votes out of 6 million of Florida, Bush got all the 29 electoral votes and Gore got zero. So the 3 million people who voted for Gore were basically disregarded and canceled and their votes, um, as the same situation in the other states for the candidate that came in second, even though it might have been very close, they were not given a proportional number of, of electoral votes. It was winner take all. And that's really what got us into the situation where you can come in second and still win. Um, so let's, um, Katie, go to the next graph. So winner takes all, in the final analysis creates what I call a distorted presidential campaign. Excuse me for one second. I have a little iced tea there. So what you have is candidates from both parties now only campaign in the 10 to 12 battleground states. It didn't start out that way, but more and more, and basically we're getting down to the last 20 years, candidate, like my first presidential election that I remember was John F. Kennedy versus Nixon. I was in seventh grade, I was 12 years old at Kenmore Junior High in Kenmore. And Kennedy, I believe in that election with the 46 states, Nixon went to all of them. The night before the election, Nixon was in Alaska because he wanted to fill the pledge of getting to all 50 states. That doesn't happen. And by the way, that was an extremely close election. In other words, every vote in the country was up for grabs, but we still had the Electoral College. And so the problem we have now with the system is all the money in a campaign, all the focus uh, on the issues and the attention in the media and throughout the country is given only to the battleground states or the swing states, thereby ignoring 
and taking for granted the other 38 to 40 states. And yes, we know that the reason they're being ignored is we know how they're going to vote. But it still changes the um, complexion of the of the election. Uh, Katie, um, underneath where you where you are in this is one more thing we can't see. But what it basically is, is what we've determined is right now in an election, about 90 percent of the campaign events in an election are decided or are, are take place in 10 or 11 states. And I just for illustration, I put a map up on the screen here, the 2016 presidential campaign. As you can see, we don't have 50 states there. We've got about 10 or 12 states. And that's based on the number of campaign events that were held in those respective states in, in 2016. And the same basically happened in, in 2020. So when you look at the map, you say, geez, the election in 2016 was about Florida, was about Ohio, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and a few others out west. But uh, so all of the, you know, all of the attention, money, but also there's other ramifications. Let's, Katie, let's go to the next screen. Okay. As you might guess in, in politics, um, preferential treatment um, from the federal government goes to the states that they have to have in order to win uh, the election. Um, studies show that swing states receive more federal grants, they get more federal emergency declarations, and their priorities are given preferred status. Example, um, in Iowa in 2020, if you recall, Trump sent literally uh, billions of dollars out to Iowa to, to crop up price supports for corn, wheat, uh, soybeans, uh, because Trump's trade policies were hurting the Iowa farmers. So the way to get that around that was simply send them money from the federal government. Iowa was one of the swing states. But it also happens on the Democratic side. Um, after 2008, Obama won Michigan. It was one of the key states he needed, even though he won the election pretty handily. But when it came time to the, after the federal, um, or what I should say, the financial crisis of 2008, um, the auto industry was in big, big trouble in Michigan, and Obama and the Democrats basically bailed out the auto industry in Michigan. Why Michigan? Because Michigan is a swing state. It's an important state that Democrats have to have. Um, and as you recall, um, Trump won it by just a few votes in um, 2016. It was one of the states that put him over the top. Biden won a little more healthily in uh, 2020. He won Michigan by about 150,000 votes. But the bottom line is Michigan's a swing state. Pennsylvania, if you recall the debates last year, um, they talked a lot about fracking. Fracking, of course, is a way to you know, pull oil out of the ground um, using all these different methods that are considered environmentally hazard, hazardous. However, um, because Pennsylvania is a swing state, again, very close in the last two elections, um, Trump won in 2016, uh, Biden won in 2020, but both were close. And the bottom line is, is that it was a swing state, and that's why the attention was was given them. So um, the the system we have right now uh, for electing a president, I'm just not, I'm not sure that's what the, the founders had in mind, where the candidates only now campaign in a few states, and they fight like hell to get to win those states and they give them government benefits in order to do that, while the rest of us sort of look on from the sidelines. So I'm sure this is an unintended, unintended consequence of uh, winner-take-all, but that's, in fact, why we have the situation, because of the winner-take-all system that the states, not the federal government, has imposed on us, but we're given the power to do that from the, um, from the founders. Okay, um, Katie, let's go to the next one. Okay, is this what the, the founders intended? Presidents elected without winning the popular vote, presidential campaigns that ignore three quarters of the country, government giving preferential treatment to the swing states. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in our question and answer um, aspect of the, of the program. And, and I gotta start moving along here because we've been talking a lot. Let's go to the next, the next, uh, okay. 
So what are the alternatives to the electoral college? Um, what I learned during my research, there was one major attempt in 1960. There's been a lot of attempts, by the way, over the last 200 years to change the electoral college. You know, James Madison wrote a letter saying that this was not the way to do it. This was 25 years after, actually 30 years after the founders, um, you know, voted for the Constitution. Uh, he had serious questions about it. But 1969, um, there was a bipartisan effort. Keep in mind, this was after the election of 1968, where Nixon beat Humphrey in a close race, but George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, won five southern states. And after the election was over, there was a concern by both Democrats and Republicans that that election could have ended in a tie um, or, in fact, had been thrown to the House because if, if Wallace would have won one or two more states, uh, he could have denied Nixon and or Humphrey uh, the majority of Electoral College. And then it would have gone into the House and you would have had us land, you know, a real major battle there. So in 1969, the House of Representatives voted 339 to 70 to amend the Constitution by electing the president by popular vote. That's over a four to one margin. In other words, there was consensus in both parties, on both sides of the aisle, that this had to be done. In the Senate, 54 Democrat, 54 senators, bipartisan coalition, were going to support and had voted to support the uh, this legislation. However, the southern states filibustered the um, proposal, and it died in the Senate because they couldn't reach the 60 vote threshold. At the time, the threshold still might have been two thirds. I can't recall, but the bottom line is today you need 60 votes to break a filibuster in the um, Senate. And at the time, the Democrat, the, the Senate only had 54 votes. So although it was a very inspired effort, it did, in fact, die um, for lack because of the filibuster, which is another issue that we're going to take up in the future. Um, so, OK, let's go to the next graph. OK, there's a there is. Um, hold on for one second. Here. There is an alternative to the to the Electoral College that has been proposed over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and it's called a National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And I'm just going to read these three graphs to you because it explains the whole thing. The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact will guarantee the presidency to the candidate who receives the most popular votes across all 50 states and the District of Columbia. The compact ensures that every vote in every state will matter in every presidential election. In other words, not just the swing states, but in every state, every voter. The compact is, is a state-based approach that preserves the electoral college, state control of elections that the constitution um, called for. The national popular vote bill has been enacted by 16 jurisdictions. 15 states and the District of Columbia, possessing 195 electoral votes. So that includes four, four small states that a lot of times people that objected to the, to changing the electoral college, it, was, it hurts the small states. Well, Delaware, Hawaii, Rhode Island, and Vermont have signed on to the compact. Eight medium-sized states, Colorado, um, Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, and three big states, California, Illinois and New York and the District of Columbia. The bill will take effect when enacted by states with 75 more electoral votes. In other words, when enough states enact this that has uh, 270, the magic number, 270 electoral votes, then this will go into effect. The bill has passed at least one chamber in nine other states um, with 88 more electoral votes. Um, Arkansas, Arizona, Maine, Michigan, um, Minnesota, North Carolina, Nevada, Oklahoma, and Virginia. A total of 3,522 state legislators, elected officials in each state from all 50 states have endorsed it. So this is an alternative to the, um, to the Electoral College. Katie, go to the next graph. So the national popular vote uh, the, the main principles are simply this. 
the national popular vote winner should become president. In other words, the person with the most votes should win. There should be one person, one vote, each vote being equal throughout the United States. And candidates should have a reason to campaign in all 50 states, which you don't have now. The winner take all provisions that the states have imposed has really distorted our elections. Where, and, and one of the big, uh, Katie, can you go to the next, um, the next graph? Um, Stuart Stevens, who's, who was a senior campaign strategist for Mitt Romney in the 2012 presidential campaign, he said, it's it is absurd to have someone who was elected by not campaigning in all the country who then has to govern the entire country. Um, it, it, it just, it, it really has come down to, is this really what the um, founders intended? One of the other aspects of just campaigning in the swing states, the battleground states, is those states get bigger turnout um, because all the attention is there, all the money spent there, all the advertising is spent there, the ground game, people are in the streets, knocking on doors. Um, I don't know if you notice in New York, um, you know, when it comes to the national election, I don't think many people have knocked on your door lately because the state is being written off. Um, but in the swing states, there are things going, as, I, as that map showed before, um, you know, we had a situation in 2016 where um, just six states got over two thirds of all of the, in other words, I, I gave you the one number about how many they got, how many events were held in the 12 swing states. But of that, two thirds of the events were held in just six states. Six states got two thirds of the attention in 2016. And in 2020, 94% of all the campaign events were held in, um, in the swing states. So um, let's go to the next graph, which I think is simply um, questions, comments, and thoughts. I think we've got got almost 15 minutes, maybe more, whatever. Um, but basically, I wanted to lay out what the history was, where it, where it came from, how how has it worked, what is what have been the um, intended and unintended consequences, um, and what are the alternatives to the Electoral College? So at this point, I'll, Katie, I guess I'll just open it up to comments, questions, um, you know, if people want to can say whatever they want. I'm I'm dying to hear what people think. Well, thank you for laying it all out there for us, Len. That was a great presentation, and we do have quite a few things here. So, the first thing we'll start with is: Do any co other countries have anything similar to this? Well, I don't want to um, purport to be an expert on um, what other countries do. Other countries. You know, England's run by a parliamentary um, uh, system where the votes in the uh, in the two houses determine who the prime minister are uh, is um, actually the House of Commons. Um, and you know, in democratic in other democratic countries, republics where the people decide, um, I'm not aware of any system that is quite as convoluted as this one. Um, so. That's about the best I can give you, but I, this is a pretty convoluted system. I mean, keep in mind, in our country, you get to vote for every office, be it Congress, governor, senator, or even a local councilman. The person who comes in first wins. Um, in our system, the person who comes in second can win. We also, when it comes to the other offices, the only office that we vote indirectly, you know, all the other offices we vote directly. We get in the booth and vote for a senator, vote for a governor. But in for president, we're voting for electors. And, you know, so again, this is a unique system that perhaps this is a time to, to look at it to see how effective it is. But let me just say something as a political observer. It is extremely difficult to amend the Constitution, particularly in the era we're living in now where things are so partisan and so divided up. That's why the compact, the popular vote compact, by the way, that was headed up by, it was created by a Republican businessman from California who just said the Electoral College no longer makes sense. 
Um, and he's been he's devoted to the last 14 years of his life to, to campaigning all over the country to see um, how this works. So anyways, go ahead. I see some comments coming up from people, broken system and yada, yada, yada. So keep it coming. All right, so we have somebody that said, wow, corruption way back then when you were talking about the 1800s. We have, um, I have a master's degree and it's still so confusing. <laughs> right. We have, um, this is the United States of America. How do you maintain states right and not have an electoral college? Right. I just saw someone who said the national popular vote is another version of electoral college. And but actually it isn't because what it does is it it dedicates itself to even if a state um where a candidate did not win but if based on who won the country overall that state's votes would go to the person who won the national popular vote the idea is to vote for someone who actually had the greatest number of votes from the the country and now look at the national popular vote compact is certainly not perfect. Uh, no system is. I'm not going to try to tell you that every system, you know, only the electoral college is flawed. But I think if you, most of the polling that has been done, uh, even going back a number of years, back, you know, in 1969, I mean, it was like 80% of the country favored doing away with the electoral college. Now, that has died down now. It's, it's, it's closer. There's still a majority of people who favor of getting rid of the electoral college, but because of the divisions we have right now, um, like for instance, there's a guy on there right now who just said people don't vote because it doesn't matter who you vote for. Um, well, I can understand people feeling that way, um, but if you if you were voting for the person who was at least going to get the most votes, in other words, won the popular vote, um, they would have to appeal. The the main issue here is coming to every state like they did in 1960. Um, they really duked it out. It was a very close election. Kennedy won the electoral college, but won the popular vote by just 118,000 votes. But in those days, every vote was up for grabs and nothing was taken for granted. And um, and so they, and, and the governing was, it seemed like the country was more unified because you know, both parties appealed to everyone in the country, not just certain sections of the country. And, um, you know, one of my, you know, again, I'm a Democrat, I was not a supporter of Trump, but it, it seemed to me that after he won the Electoral College um, in 2016, he was basically focused on those states that voted for him. And what you really need is, a, you know, there's only one office where the person who wins the presidency that's the person who's responsible for the entire country. We only have one president, and it seems like everybody should have a president, not just, you know, those that happen to win prior to the votes of the person who won. Um, but go ahead. Any other um, comments, questions? Uh, this question I'm seeing is, do you think the need for a legitimate third party would allow for the system to work better? Well, uh, keep in mind, in 1968, uh, there was a third party. Wallace ran on, I think it was called the American Independent Party. Um, and look, at, I think there's going to be probably other parties that are going to at least try to get started. Um, the idea, though, is, is that the person who governs should have the most support of the governed. In other words, the people who are looking for re you know representation and leadership from their president the person who does that should have the most votes from the country. A third party would probably, in some cases, um, maybe eliminate a person who gets the majority of the popular vote. One thing about the election in 2020 is Biden, even though it was very close to the Electoral College, he was the first president in a while who got the, a clear majority of the votes. He, he, he won a majority of the country, 51.3% of the vote. Um, and you know 306 electoral votes but again 44,000 vote difference in those three states trump would still be president even though we lost the election by over 7 million votes that's so i guess one of the trends is it's it, it's becoming more pronounced um first it was 500,000 votes gore lose 
Then it was 2.8 million votes. Hillary loses, but you know, I mean, she wins by 2.8, but loses the election. Biden wins clearly over 7 million votes, but almost lost the electoral college. So it was a lot closer than people really thought. Definitely. Thanks, Len. Uh, we have a comment here. It says, excellent presentation, clarified a lot about the electoral college and why we need to do something different. Looking forward to your next presentation. Uh, we have this, and, and I'm sorry if you addressed it already, but I this is, I didn't see New York State among the states signed on to the National Popular Vote Compact. Would New York State want to be a partner for this? They did sign on. New York is, they did sign on. All right. Thank you. Uh, what? So, do you think the electoral college will ever go away? It's one of our questions. Well, I, I can say this: not in my lifetime. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think it's going to be a long time. Um, it's difficult to amend the constitution, and that was, that was, done for specific reasons. But you know, we're we're really most people think. Um, keep in mind, the reason the founders didn't want the the average person voting directly for the president is they didn't think they had enough information. They didn't think they knew enough. Well, that was 250 years ago. Now we have, you know, 24 seven um, uh, internet, TV, communications. I mean, we're bombarded with government all day, every day. So people have plenty of information. They can make up their minds. Um, we have, you know, a thoroughly modern uh, country, transportation, communication, financial, whatever. Uh, this is an entirely different country than what it was 200 back in 1787 when the founders made these decisions. So it's outdated, but I think the biggest problem with it is it's it's undemocratic. It just simply allows for a person who who didn't win the popular vote of their country to become the most, the you know, the leader of the most powerful country in the world, and um, but again, people disagree on that as well. So, yeah, seen a couple more things here, Len. This is: Do you think the system could change to split the electoral votes of a state based on the voting percentage won by each candidate? That way, each state would matter. Well, that's certainly one of the alternatives. The problem with that is it's called proportional voting. And it certainly makes more sense than what we have now. But under that system, because you still have to break down, you know, there's a there is a set number of electoral votes. There's 538, uh, um, and you have a hundred that are in the Senate, um, or you know, based on what's in the Senate. So you still you could still elect the president without getting the most popular votes under a proportional system. So the, the best way to alleviate this problem is simply, remember the map that I showed you way at the beginning, there's the country, there's 538 electoral votes. What the electoral college does, in my way of thinking, is, is it distorts that map. It distorts it based on popular vote, but it also distorts it based on the attention that is given to the swing states and the other states are ignored. The purest way to do this is the person who gets the most votes should win. And yeah, I don't know how you get any clearer than that. All right, thanks, Len. This is, uh, what do you think of the New York City mayor format as a precursor to a national election? Oh, so they're referring to the ranked voting. Um, and keep in mind, the you have a situation where in New York City they had, I think they had thirteen or fourteen people running, so the rank voting ranks the top five. Um, so I think in an election like that, I think rank voting is something that we're going to be seeing more of. It started in California; it's now worked its way across um, the country to New York City, um, and. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly if it would be um, how if it would um, in some way empower somebody who didn't have the popular vote. Again, you know, in New York City, they wound up having 
took about a month to decide who won that election. And as it turns out, the person who came in first the first night did win, but he won. It's funny. He won by um, a big margin on primary night and barely won in the end. After all those ranked votes were done, uh, Eric Adams barely got over the top. But um, I think that's something we're going to, but I think we're going to be seeing more of that because in the end, the ranked voting gives each voter a little more say in the outcome. You rank your first choice, but if you don't get your first choice, you know, your second choice gets gets figured into the, so you might, although you didn't get everything you wanted, you might get something close to what you wanted. So I think there's a reason the rank voting is is starting to, to come on. And I think we're gonna see more of it in the future. Okay, thanks, Len. Uh, let's see, so this I think is two parts, but we'll start with this part. This is the opposing argument for switching to the popular vote is that federal candidates would only campaign in the few states with the largest populations, like New York with New York City, California with LA, et cetera, and then ignore states like maybe Iowa, Delaware, and Rhode Island. What are your thoughts? Okay, that's a great question, and I have an answer for you. Um, in the research I did, um, this country, when it comes to the major urban areas, New York City, Chicago, LA, Detroit, whatever. When you look at the entire population, about 15% of the country lives in large urban cities. At the same time, when you look at the entire country, all 50 states, rural America, in other words, the people who vote from the rural areas make up, guess what? About 15% of the country. So that's about 30% of the entire country. The rest of the country is really considered suburban America. It's not small versus big. It's it's really suburbs that are throughout the entire country in all 50 states. And that's part of the, you know, when the founders first started talking about it, they used that argument. Well, the, the big guy is gonna push around the little guy. And um, of course there were only 13 states at the time and all of them were you know pretty much rural areas there weren't any big cities um but still the idea of a state like virginia what was the largest at the time would have much more influence than delaware or rhode island but right now people forget in the last election one of the reasons trump did better than expected was the huge rural vote that came out throughout the country yes the democrats did better in the urban america but Trump did much better in rural America. But what decided the election, if you look at almost any report about analyzing the 2020 election, is when Trump lost ground in the suburbs. You know, those areas that are considered swing areas where people just, you know, didn't like the way he handled the pandemic. He didn't like the way he, uh, you know, treated different minority groups. and. So suburban America is really what decides election in this country in this day and age. And that's why the battleground in the next election will be the suburbs. Um, but the bottom line is, if you really, if the whole country was open, certainly candidates are gonna run, gonna go to those areas where people are most likely to vote for them. But their challenge is, is to get those people to in fact vote. You know, keep in mind, one of the, this is one point in leaving everybody today when our time runs out here is up until the last election, our turnout has been down. Um, you know, in in 1960, when Kennedy was elected over Nixon, uh, we had, um, I think about 70, 75 percent of the country voted. We were at times in the in the 21st century and in, in the 20th century, we were down under 50 percent. I mean, we our turnout, our voting turnout is much lower than other industrialized countries in Europe and around the world. Um, and that's because, you know, we just have this few states, even within those few states, a few areas that really count. And so when you look at all the money that's spent, you know, billions of dollars are spent now in politics, but they're spent in very, very small areas on TV, mail, um, different, you know, neighborhood door-to-door -door type situations. 
but that's an incredible amount of money being spent in a um, a very small area. If that money was spread out, I mean, I think there's too much money in politics, but that's another question. That's a Supreme Court issue. But to have a, a concentration of money in such so few states and so few areas um, is, I think, a big problem. By the way, I just saw a little question pop up on the screen. Do you think it'd be better if election day was a holiday? I absolutely think that would be better in that more people would vote. Um, a lot of people can't vote simply because they're too busy, you know, working during the day, picking up their kids from daycare afterwards, uh, getting home, make dinner, they're tired by the end of the day. Um, if we had one day where the, it was devoted to the country's governance, that this is the day of the year that we pick where everybody's gonna participate and vote for whoever you want, um, but let's have, the, there's no doubt that the greatest amount of participation, the greater the participation rates, the better it is for the governance of that country. And um, we, we, you know, one thing that it showed when I talked about the winner take all is the winner take all states get, have much higher turnout because there's competition for their votes. And all, all these other states, three quarters of the states that don't see anybody, um, people vote, but they do not vote with enthusiasm or in the highest uh, number of, of votes that are possible. Thanks, Len. Uh, we'll just, do, is it okay if we do two more questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so this one here is, do you think the amount of mail-in and early ballots is why there was such a large turnout this past election? Well, I certainly, there's no doubt we had a historical uh, problem. We had a pandemic. So because, you know, the, we really didn't do a great job at first um, dealing with the pandemic. Uh, people were obviously afraid to come to the polls and mix with a lot of people and, and perhaps risk getting the, the, the virus. So, yeah, states said in this particular year, we're going to make it easier to, pe to have people vote by mail. And uh, that's what we did. And so, yeah, do I think it probably helped turn out? Yes, it certainly wasn't illegal. I mean, we, we're voting. By the way, it should be noted that some states vote by mail every election. Out in Washington, Oregon, I think Utah, there's three or four states right now where people vote by mail for every election. So, um, you know, Trump tried to make that a, uh, you know, an issue of you know, implying some corruption. The only reason it was even put in place was because of the pandemic. And, um, but I, you know, I favor any means possible to turn out the greatest number of people because every person in this country should have one vote. It should be equal. We shouldn't have, you know, one state more important than another. All right, thanks, Len. And we'll close it out with this question. It's a thank you, great presentation. What will it take to bring the country back together? It's going to take, um, I think, um, it, it's it's my feeling that in the last 40 years, um, financial interest, you can call it corporal interest, you can, whatever, but people looking for tax breaks have influenced the government with, with large amounts of money, going to both parties, by the way, I'm not saying one party is more guilty than the other, but, um, and there's been a focus off the issues dealing with the everyday citizen, the person, an average person who's trying to raise a family um, and, uh, you know, have a job, save money for college, have money for their senior years. Um, it seems like we were most united, it was after World War II, and the 20 years after that, the country was really sort of all in it together, uh, getting over the war, uh, getting the, the soldiers educated with the GI Bill, uh, providing support for families, for housing. Um, a lot of that has, has really gone away, and I think Biden is getting back to that now. But what we've had is a situation where uh, tax cuts have been the most important thing that um, to a lot of interest in the Congress, and um, it's gone overboard. I think some of it was needed at first, but I think it's became excessive. And then they, you know, basically anything that helped the average person I mean, let's face it, now it's much more expensive to go to college. It's much more expensive to get health insurance. It's much more expensive to have your kids in childcare. It is average working families are up against it. 
where the biggest breaks in this country go to the richest people right now. And look at, we should celebrate those people that have done well, but I think everybody should pay their fair share. And when everybody's in this together, doing their share, whatever that share may be, I think we have a better country. I think we're, we're, we're looking out for the, the broader interests and not just the special interests. And I think, you know, it's gonna be a while before we get the country back on track, but I think we're starting to move in the right direction. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Len, for that. That was fantastic. And we just have a bunch of thank yous. Thank you for explaining this in a way I can understand. Thank you for your right. time today. Looking forward to seeing you again in the fall. Hey, Katie, thanks so much. And we'll be back in the fall. Absolutely. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks.